Ah, it's great to be here. I can't believe it was five years since uh, last had an opportunity to be here and, and talk to you all. You know, I only have 15 minutes and I've been told stay on time because I guess Jim typically, the other Jim typically runs way, way, way over. And you know, I used to run an airline, so I'm gonna keep this thing relatively on time. And so given that I have 15 minutes, I would love to talk to you about what Red Hat's doing and some of the extraordinary things we're doing around Linux and then things that we're doing on top of Linux. But I'd rather use this time to really reflect on the impact over the last 25 years that Linux has had, not just on technology, but more broadly what I see happening uh, in business. So if you'll bear with me, I'd like to just spend a few minutes talking about at least what I see every day dealing uh, with large enterprises and the impact that it both has already had, but I think also the impact that we'll be able to see going forward. And so I'm gonna use a S-curve analogy around it, and I wanna talk about, from a technology perspective, the adoption that we've seen and the impact that's had. I then wanna talk about more broadly the impact that I think it's having on business itself and the way organizations are operating and getting things done and then I think what we can do going forward. Now, I'm gonna go through this next page very, very quickly. This page was originally to basically talk about history of Linux, but somebody on there is gonna do what I saw last night and see, you know, kernel 2.6, that's not really history, that was just a few years ago. So, we often think about with technologies when we think about an S-curve is a level of adoption where something starts and it works and slowly kind of builds and over time, you know, it gets better and, you know, Clayton Christensen, Innovator's Dilemma as a model that innovation happens. But the more as I started to reflect on the history of Red Hat, and it's really hard to talk about the history of Red Hat without talking about Linux, and it's hard to talk about Linux without talking about Red Hat because the two were so long, so closely have worked together and you know, continue to work well together. But when I really think about Red Hat as a business and enterprise adoption around Linux, there was certainly a lot of adoption happening uh, in the 90s as you know, what I'll call really bleeding edge people started to use Linux and think about it. And you know, Red Hat was a big part of that, passionate about open source and, and what open source uh, is and could mean. But frankly, as a business model, we didn't have one. It was selling, literally selling t-shirts and coffee mugs. And that's not necessarily really good business. And if I had to say beyond the technology, and Red Hat's historically been either the largest or second largest contributor to uh, Linux over you know, two decades now, but I'd say aside from our technology contributions, one of the major contributions that Red Hat has made broadly uh, to Linux and to open source is business model innovation, right? We ultimately decided that you know, having a uh, business model that involved selling T-shirts and coffee mugs probably wouldn't work and had tried a box product at, at uh, CompUSA. That didn't work really well either. And so a group of our folks got together and said, well, wait a minute, to really make this phenomenal technology available for enterprises, we need to create a level of stability. So how do we kind of take the power of this open innovation and kind of create kind of long-term binary compatibility and certified ecosystems and all the kind of downstream things that enterprises need. And so we kind of created this business model around, we call it enterprise open source, where we take all open source software and then offer it with a defined life, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not here to talk about our business model, but more to say that's kind of was around 2001, Red Hat's kind of major innovation around business model. I think this is important to, to talk about for a minute because the amazing thing to me about Linux isn't that it started bottom up, it's that in the enterprise it started top down, right? So where Red Hat got its first major wins were with investment banks running massively mission critical exchanges, right? Trading platforms, right? It wasn't working its way up from file servers and kind of from bottom up. It really started our big initial wins on the enterprise side were with the large investment banks running trading platforms. Now you pause and think about that. I don't want to draw a caricature of investment bankers, but many of you who've been involved with startups will recognize this. These typically aren't people who care a lot about freedom. These aren't people who, you know, kind of even care about cost, right? These are people who care about best possible feature functionality at any cost. 
and they adopted Linux. Very simply, Linux on x86 was faster than Unix on RISC. And within just a couple of years, all of Wall Street moved. Now, I joined Red Hat in 2008, and my mental model of Linux was, I think of many was, it's kind of a thing that's working its way from the sysadmin up. And I started looking at Red Hat's uh, list of customers, and I started scratching my head saying, these are amazing customers running their most mission critical applications. Why? And you know, the answer is because it's better. And you kind of scratch your head and say, okay, it's better, and it's also cheaper. So it's better and it's cheaper, you know, so why isn't everybody you know, running this? And I think what we're seeing over time is we continue to make uh, progress, and I'll come back uh, to that comment. But just again, to talk about the power of sharing, you know, the reason that Linux runs these large trading platforms has a lot to do with the fact that the Navy had a problem of it, uh, wanting to build new anti-missile defense systems post uh, Falkland Islands um, and some of the issues happening there with you know, uh, anti-ship missiles. And so they needed a real-time operating system and you know, we worked with them, we meaning the community, not just Red Hat, wor worked with them to build features into the operating system to allow for real-time performance. Those were the same features that investment banks needed to run some of the most highest performing mission critical financial transaction systems in the world. That's one example of just myriad numbers of very odd kind of um, combinations and collaborations that happened to create what was even in the early 2000s really an extraordinarily powerful system. And we've now spent the last kind of since 2001 with the initial Red Hat Enterprise Linux really driving from the top down. Right, it's been more, not how do we add feature and functionality, it's been more driving against, you know, frankly, inertia and lack of knowledge about the power of this. But to have a technology that's both better and cheaper is an extraordinary place to be. And so I think Red Hat's been kind of at a forefront of kind of watching that adoption. Last year at Red Hat Summit, which is an annual event we have um, around Red Hat's kind of product stack, Paul Cormier, who's been head of products and technology at Red Hat for a lot of years, um, kind of made a proclamation. And I should back up on that. We have this on our walls all over, right? This is a famous Gandhi quote, and I'll have to say for the real historians in the room, there's still uh, some controversy over whether Gandhi really said this or not. Um, so for those of you who want to research that, you can kind of see all the back and forth. But regardless, I think it is a really powerful and a statement of how disruptive uh, change happens. First they ignore you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. And so last year at Summit, Paul puts this up and basically for the first time says, you know what, at least at the level of Linux, we won. Now let me pause on that for a second, what I mean by, by we've won. You know, Red Hat spent from its early days through until recently, I would argue, fighting a battle to say open source is a viable alternative to traditional software stacks. And I think we've done that, and I think we demonstrated that over a long period of time. Our next aspiration for open source is to not be a viable alternative, but to be the default choice for next generation software stacks. And I would argue we are there. If you look at net new workloads, whether those are you know, things that are being built on the cloud, whether those are big data, analytics, machine learning, the default choice for those net new workloads is running on Linux. It's not a viable alternative, it is the default choice, which is an extraordinary thing. Because not only is it extraordinary, obviously, that this thing that started off as this very, very small movement has grown to be the default choice for next generation of technology. It also now serves as the platform on which most net new innovation happens, right? Big data, you know, Hadoop, Spark, all the things happening there, happening on Linux. SDN, all of the innovation that's happening there, happening on Linux. Containers, happening on Linux. It has become the platform on which the whole next generation of technologies develop. So it really is the platform for innovation. I'm actually thrilled to see, if you ever need validation of that, that Microsoft is starting to 
uh, embrace Linux. Um, thrilled to see that. Um, I was actually, I'll say a few weeks ago, I was with Satya at his office and I like stole four Microsoft pens as you know, souvenirs because when's the Red Hat CEO actually you know, at Microsoft? Um, but it's amazing to see the collaboration with a whole set of technologies, both in Linux and driving things into Linux, but importantly, driving the software stack around that. So I'm very interested to hear what Wim has to say. And we've had a phenomenal um, uh, working relationship now over the last uh, couple of years, which is just amazing, right? We really have two operating systems now in the data center, Linux and Windows. And again, I would argue most net new workloads are actually an innovation that's happening around uh, Linux. That's at a technology level. I want to spend the few minutes I have left talking about what to me as a traditional executive, if you want to say before I joined Red Hat, um, has also seen in terms of the power of what Linux has done. And I would argue long term might be even uh, a more impactful uh, on the world than the technology itself. And that's the social DNA that is developed around how to coordinate thousands of volunteers to get things done. Um, I talked to CEOs around the world. This is not one. I just thought this was a good picture, but that's, that's not a CEO that I talked to. Um, we live in a world that is dramatically accelerating, and the problems that businesses face now are not, no longer how do I coordinate thousands of people doing rote tasks in a static environment, right? The problems most business, because those problems have been solved, right? They've been automated with either robotics or information technology or additive manufacturing, right? The jobs that are left are people who have to apply either initiative or judgment or creativity to their jobs. And we're this is all happening in a rapidly moving context for how fast business moves. And so what I hear over and over and over again from executives is my structures, my management structure is not helping me innovate. It doesn't help me attract the best people. It doesn't get the best ideas out of my people. Um, and it doesn't allow me to be agile and able to change. And that's a problem. I actually did write a book that Jim mentioned, and I want to be clear what the book is. It's not anything that I've done. It's what I have learned from Red Hat, which Red Hat learned from the open source community. And that, again, is if you think about what management is and traditional management, hierarchies, bureaucracies, all that stuff, management is coordinating people's behavior to get common things done. And Linux really developed a whole different way to coordinate behavior by breaking problems into small pieces, how interactions happen. And it's amazing to look at that, and Red Hat's applied that to how we run the business, and so me coming in from the outside kind of saw, wow, this isn't just a great way to develop software, it's a great way to coordinate bright people who have to apply judgment and creativity to their jobs, and it, but still able to coordinate to get things done. In the case of Linux, something that's of such high quality that it runs nuclear submarines and stock exchanges. In traditional business, how do you actually coordinate people to get other things done uh, and accomplish tasks when, again, you're not dealing with people doing rote tasks in a static environment, but you're trying to get best and brightest to work on difficult problems. That, I think, could, can be another massive legacy of Linux and open source, is literally a different way to organize people to get things done in the world. And in the interest of time, I'll go through this quickly. You can look at that in a lot of regards. It's not just within a company. Many of the problems that we need to solve cross companies, right? So if you think about something, and I get asked this a lot by executives in pharmaceutical, in automakers, it's, wow, the problems I have to solve today span my corporate boundaries. So how do I actually coordinate, collaborate, share across corporate boundaries, right? And in this example, no single technology company I don't think is going to fully solve the autonomous driving problem. No single automaker is going to solve the autonomous driving problem. The need for coordination across technologies, state and local governments, um, the, the makers of the vehicles, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, require a whole different way of coordination. And again, I think that's something that 
we've learned so much from Linux about a different way to coordinate across corporate boundaries, no matter where people work. And uh, these are three names, I could have put up 100 names of companies that, this is literally in the last couple weeks I pulled these, of companies that talk about open source, not from a technology perspective, but how they're running their business. Nike has specifically said, we want to leverage the principles of open source and sharing to help us deal with industry transitions. IKEA talks about open source mindset and how it runs. Toyota just open sourced all of its hydrogen patents. It's, uh, it, it's becoming much more involved in thinking about how to drive innovation broadly. And I could put quotes from Ford and GM. The term open source and thinking about working cross corporate boundaries is becoming the norm for leading edge companies. And I would argue it's gonna become more and more the norm um, broadly if companies wanna survive. So we can certainly talk about Linux and what the 25 years have done for a technology stack. And beyond the technology stack is the platform that allows a new set of innovation. But I would actually argue the social DNA that was developed to coordinate a different set of you know, volunteers to work together is already massively impactful on business and will be going forward. So quickly on what's next, I think the same social DNA as well as the technology stack can really help us solve the mega world problems. So if you start thinking about things like global hunger, curing diseases like cancer, global warming, these are massive, massive, massive daunting problems, right? There is no institution, there is no country, there's certainly no individuals that are gonna solve this. This is actually requires, again, a different way of people thinking and working together. Um, and I do think that Linux as a technology, but more broadly as a social DNA about how people can work together, has the potential to dramatically impact human outcomes and get some of the most daunting challenges. I, I used this statement at Red Hat Summit a, a few weeks ago, that our ability to harness and distill the best ideas will determine the progress of human progress for the next century. And when I say the ability to harness and distill the best ideas, that is how you get people to work together, right? And what we know is the traditional way we've done that, proscribing you know, hierarchies, that does not work. That does not get best innovation out of people. And I think what Linux has done, and broadly what we're seeing continue to innovate around open source, is really develop a better way to harness and distill the best ideas. So, Again, we can talk about Linux for what it's done in technology, but I think its impact so far on the world has been so much broader, and where I see the possibility for it to go is truly extraordinary. So I'm just thrilled to be able to be a part of that, and I'm thrilled that Red Hat's been a part of that. Um, so happy birthday, happy 25th. Uh, thank you all, and um, thank you all for your work to make it all possible. Thanks.